Welcome back to another episode of Wilds and Water Sailing. Our friends Paul and Carolyn had taken off from the anchorage before dawn, with the intention to make their way back northward again. It was just the three of us once more, and Conley and I were making our own plans to head further south within the next day or so, should the weather allow. On this morning there was barely a breath of wind, and the bay seemed especially serene. Beams of rich golden sun escaped the scattered cover of puffy cumulus, and as the forest warmed, smells of cedar and damp earth were heavy in the air. As we sat eating a late breakfast, a wolf emerged from along the tree line right beside Acklet, a sub-adult, fulvous and grey, and visibly soaking wet. With a long and leisurely, yet exceptionally efficient stride, she crossed the grassy knoll in front of us. As we watched her move effortlessly, it wasn't hard to believe how these coastal wolves travel so many miles in their perpetual pursuit of the diverse diet that sustains them. She stopped halfway, turned, and surveyed us, giving us a long, fixed stare before ridding herself of the excess water that clung to her thick coat. As she carried on at a slow trot, we realized there was another, darker adult that must have snuck past us while we weren't looking and was now slowly and carefully making her way along the rocky shoreline ahead. A few minutes later, a third wolf came trotting out of the trees. We figured they must have crossed the bay just up from Aklet, as this one too was sopping wet. Coastal First Nations have long known about this unique species and its fascinating differences including its habitat and behaviour, but it wasn't until recently that the coastal wolf was finally identified as genetically distinct and classified as a new and separate subspecies by modern science. For hundreds of years, wolves have been misjudged, often being demonised and as a result hunted to extinction in some areas. Although their presence may not be fully valued and understood, their absence can quickly lead to many adverse effects within the ecosystems they naturally inhabit. Our most memorable encounter had to be early the next day as we were preparing to leave. This black wolf walked out into the open and lay down right next to the boat. For nearly an hour it lay there, its gaze fixed on us. Some nations on the BC coast are now working closely with groups such as the Rainforest Conservation Foundation in efforts to protect these wolves in certain areas of the Great Bear Rainforest. There are, however, many areas that remain unprotected, such as Banks Island, and are therefore vulnerable to habitat degradation and trophy hunting two of the coastal wolves' greatest threats. Among British Columbia's countless treasures are its stunning and capricious coastline, its diverse wilderness, and its extraordinary wildlife, all of which are interconnected with the lives of these coastal wolves. They are yet one more reason why responsible land and ecosystem management are so critical and why it's consequential to keep large portions of wilderness wild, with equal focus on rewilding areas that have been previously damaged. It wasn't long after pulling out of No Name Bay on Banks Island that we were able to get the pole out and set our wings for a beautiful downwind run. Yeah. 
we are sailing to Dudney Island. 30 miles to go. About 40 when we started. Got seven knots on the ground. Winds 15 to 20 from the Beanie High. Wing on wind. Reef in the main. China. Batteries are full. It's a good day. For most of the day, we cruised along at a steady six knots, watching the waves and studying the small islands we passed on our way to Dudney Island. Many of the islets on their westerly faces were towering bluffs of dark rock worn smooth by the waves. It was pretty wild trying to imagine the frequent winter storms responsible for shaping these sea cliffs. It would be very cool to see, however, maybe from the land side of things rather than from the boat. After a somewhat lazy day of downwind sailing, we decided it would be fun to tack the last two miles up into Gillen Harbour. As we rounded the light and switched the Genoa for the jib, we must have hit an acceleration zone, and we're soon tacking a narrow channel with maybe a bit too much sail. I wish I had gotten it on camera because it was so rowdy, my phone went overboard, which was sad, mainly because that meant our sea shanties stopped playing. After tacking the rest of the way in sad silence, we dropped the hook and enjoyed the splendid views of Campania Island in the distance. The next morning after coffee and yet another coastal wolf sighting, we sailed off anchor and made our way out with our sights set on Surf Inlet on Princess Royal Island. As we approached Kamanyo Sound, we noticed that a giant string of free-floating logs, some nearly whole trees with full root balls attached, were blocking our path. A spring tide, accompanied by ideal wind and current, had pulled all of these logs off the surrounding shores, and had created a rather dangerous debris-laden course for us to navigate through. Sailing along at seven knots on a fresh breeze, we were headed right for it, with the wind steadily increasing as we approached the obstruction. We decided this would be a good opportunity to practice what we like to call a chicken jibe, 
where instead of actually turning down to jibe, we turn upwind and tack around before falling off the wind again. In strong winds such as these, it ends up being a lot easier going on the rig and equipment, and is a great alternative to a regular downwind jibe. We are pretty fortunate to have an aluminum boat when faced with challenges like this. However, just because a log won't necessarily put a hole through the hull, doesn't mean it can't get under the boat and dust our prop right off. Although this was the most debris we have ever sailed through, logs and deadheads in the water on this coast are very common, and it's one of the reasons we choose not to do overnight passages here. Once we were safely through the chaos, the wind began to die down and after shaking out a reef, we put the pole out and switched to the Genoa. Where are we headed to today? Uh, Surf Inlet. Royal Island. Home of the? Spirit Bear. Yeah. Yes, there's a large population of black bears. Apparently a few white ones. <laughs> How's the sail been today? Oh, it started out really good. And now it's still really good. Just a little slow. Sails are banging around. Downwind. Lots of sticks in the water. Going against the current. <laughs> but we got sea wolves this morning, so that makes up for it. Sure does. And we got to sail the whole way. Not jinxing us. Just saying. We're doing pretty good if we only have a few miles left. That's true. Have a good nap. After what felt like a full day of sailing and a successful 30 nautical miles traveled, we had arrived at Surf Inlet in the heart of the Great Bear Rainforest.
are just getting into uh, Surf Inlet, going to Ken Harbor. Uh, we just kind of lost our wind as we were coming in. Uh, we've got the motor on and we've got about four miles to go to our anchorage. And it was really fun seeing this in the winter time and now seeing it again, uh, I guess as summer is approaching or is here. Um, and it's so beautiful. It's yeah, it's still just as beautiful as it was before. We're hoping to see a spirit bear or two, maybe, and uh, yeah, and then we're gonna carry on further south. Welcome to Penn Harbor, a cozy little nook of an anchorage about nine miles in from the mouth and three quarters of the way up Surf Inlet. Thick forested slopes rise from every edge and a number of small streams fall through boulders and stone into the head of the harbor. We also found one green grassy meadow for more to run around on before we departed for the head of Surf Inlet the next day. <laughs> Although it may look flat calm here, we actually had a 15 to 20 knot breeze giving us a nice boost towards the head of the inlet. This is a great example of what sailing the steep sided BC fjords can be like, as there are always many variables at play. It's typical that winds usually blow up or down a channel, however local topography tends to create lees and acceleration zones. For this reason, unless we are tacking upwind, we like to use only our head sail. This is a configuration that allows us to accommodate a wider range of wind angles and helps eliminate the risk of an accidental jibe should the winds get a bit too spicy. Even though it looks like there's ample room to anchor, the inlet here is very deep, about 100 meters in the middle, so finding a spot to drop the hook was a bit more challenging than we'd expected. After driving around in circles for a while, we decided on a spot that was just over 30 meters deep. How are you? Are you good? Hi. You're so pretty. You know, I know. I know that you know. <laughs> Hello. Which I do have an extra hand. I'm not doing anything with Ditch right. You're so observant. Thanks so much for joining us for this episode. If you liked it, make sure to hit that thumbs up button. And if you haven't already, hit subscribe and click that bell for notifications. Join us next week to explore the overgrown trails of the Port Belmont Mine and for a whole lot of tacking as we check out a few other anchorages in Surf Inlet 
each with their own unique charm.